Absolutely, I completely agree with you. Completely agree. And this is also important, you know, to discuss about the Destiny 6, because uh, how pathologists are going to evaluate HER2 ultra low. ASCOCAP is not helping us. So they need to identify a cluster of cells between zero and less than 10% in order to be eligible to an innovative treatment like trastuzumab deruxina. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, that was a standing ovation when, when we had the original TDXD and the Destiny Breast Study. And I know we just, it's something that's just so magical when you present a study and you see the study and you're in the audience and you just, the, the transformative nature of a clinical study and, and the impact that it helps for our patients, you know? What was it like as, as one of the early PIs and helping out with the Trastuzumab deroxatecan study uh, and, and to see where it is today? My, you know, for me, it was a great emotion uh, to stand at 7.30 a.m. in the morning in front of an audience of 15,000 people. You know, when they told me, okay, we accepted your abstract, but you have two options. The first one is on Sunday, 7.30. The second one is on Tuesday at the end of the meeting. I said, I prefer 7.30 in the morning, and I hope people will attend the <laughs> session. And so when I saw that the room was fully booked, and there was a, also an overflow outside. Angela De Michele sent to me a WhatsApp and said, wow, thanks for building, for bringing here all these people at 7.30 in the morning. And so when I started to present to here, there are all the people in your field, in the breast cancer field, there are representatives of the pharma companies, so also many other stakeholders like patients. So you have to deliver this presentation to let understand to the people what the group of co-authors did, what globally the co-investigators did. I just presented data on behalf of all the people that worked. And finally, if you remember, I, I thank a lot also people who came at 7.30 in the morning to listen to the data. Absolutely. It's a great yes, yes. I mean, that just shows that when you have such transformative science and you know, regardless of the time, when you have such an impactful uh, information for help our patients, that we're there. And it was such a magical experience. And so, so yeah, so let's go ahead and get into the details. Um, you know, starting with, you know, the uh, ASCO uh, Destiny Breast 06, uh, you know, this is very interesting here um, with, the, uh, with the ultra low. Can you kind of help the audience kind of understand this ultra low concept and then start getting into you know, the sequencing uh, of this uh, medication in terms of the study. Absolutely. So the Destiny Breast 6 was a prospective randomized trial evaluating the activity of trastuzumab deruxtecan in patients with HR positive, HER2 low, and their 2 ultra low metastatic breast cancer after one or two lines of previous endocrine therapy. Patients never received chemotherapy in the trial. The definition we gave to a two ultra low, it's any staining between zero and one plus. So we included the patients one plus and two plus and patients with any staining between zero and one plus. This was an important study because we moved to early lines, the use of trastuzumab deruxtecan that actually is approved after one line of chemotherapy. 866 patients have been randomized to trastuzumab deruxtecan versus chemotherapy of investigator choice. And uh, almost uh, 753 patients were HER2 low, 1 plus and 2 plus, and 153 were HER2 ultra low. Median progression free survival, as you saw, was improved uh, from eight months in the chemotherapy arm to 13.2 months in the trastuzumab deruxtecan arm, both in their too low and in their too ultra low population. So really are very similar, the outcome. And when we evaluate response rate, the response rate was 57% in the intent to treat population versus 31, and it was 60% in their too ultra low population versus 30%. We have also preliminary data of overall survival being 71% uh, of patients still alive in the chemotherapy arm and almost 80% in the trastuzumab deruxtecan arm. So this was a positive study, in my opinion, practice changing, 
and now trastuzumab deruxtecan is a new treatment option in patients never pretreated with chemotherapy, HR positive or too low and do trolo metastatic breast cancer. Yeah, I think it's wonderful for our patients uh, is to have such, you know, uh, a response rate for even for altered low HER2. And, and you know, this is something as a, as a clinician that I talk to a lot of medical oncologists across the country is, you know, you have that uh, metastatic ER positive, hormone positive, uh, you know, positive uh, cancer, where you have that first line with, with the CDK4-6 based uh, treatment, you know, question at the PIK3CA plus or minus with AI, or, you know, CDK4-6 with fulvestrant, and then you got that sequencing where now we have some stata, maybe a post-monarch to continue with the CDK4-6, and then if they have a P10 mutation, add CAPI, and then you have that next after that, then you start thinking, okay, um, we have to start thinking about systemic chemo. Uh, some people start thinking about capsidabine there. Some people, you know, the old ages, they used the Bolero study with the exomestane and Everlimus there. But if you, you know, this data, it seems like you can, there's, a, there's an unmet need there rather than prolonging exomestane and Everlimus for patients that are ER refractory uh, breast cancer. What, what are your thoughts? Oh, you did an excellent summary like a breast cancer expert finally, because you, you did an overview of all the second line treatment. I agree with you. The first line will remain... Uh, endocrine therapy plus CDK for 6 inhibitor C. The second line, you have a biomarker-driven approach. So if ESR1 mutant, uh, you will have a lacestrant. If PI3 kinase AKT P10 mutant, you will have capibacertib. If BRCA mutant, PARP inhibitors, if no alteration or exemestane everolimus or full vestrant and everolimus. But, you know, the median PFMs in this second line treatment is less than seven months. Wow. Also with capibacertib, following CDK for six inhibitor, median PFS is only five months. So there is a high medical need in this patient population and giving capicitabine or paclitaxel does not improve overall survival. So I really believe you should clearly consider trastuzumab deruxtecan. It was the only drug to demonstrate a dramatic improvement in median PFS with also a positive impact on overall survival. You know, the Destiny 4 was positive for overall survival. It will be also the Destiny 6, even if we have to consider that many of the patients in the control arm did the crossover to trastuzumab deruxtecan because it was approved. So once they progressed in the control arm, they received trastuzumab deruxtecan. Up to now, they are 21% of those patients. Yeah, and, and you know, proof of principle, uh, you know, for, for most oncologists is, what about, you know, in other subtypes? And, and you look at this pan tumor indication that was FDA approved in the United States uh, with the HER2 IHC3+. Plus, and so that's for any cancers. That just yeah. shows you how impactful this medication is, regardless of the tumor type. So this is something that, that's transformative in terms of oncology treatments. Yes, it's a smart chemotherapy, as we wrote together with Paolo on a beautiful radio article on CA. So, you know... Uh, we have an approval actually for any tumor with immunohistochemical 3 plus based on the PAN tumor uh, Destiny 02. But we recently published another paper for a 2 mutant. Oh, wow. That has been published on the Lancet Oncology just a few weeks ago, in which we assessed the activity of trastuzumab deruxtecan in 2 mutant tumors. As you know, there is already an indication in osmocell cell lung cancer for a 2 mutant in osmocell cell lung cancer. But if you check the paper on Lancet Oncology, you will see that in tumors with their two mutation, being breast cancer, of course, biliary tract cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, colorectal cancer, there is a clear activity of trastuzumab deruxtecan with an impressive median PFS and an excellent response rate. Absolutely. And you know, the other thing as, as medical oncologists and just talking with different colleagues is this awareness of this uh, pneumonitis. Since we all have our thinking caps on, we're keeping close eye on things. It seems like in the real world, there's less uh, incidence of this pneumonitis because, you know, as a leader, you've done such a great job in terms of grade one pneumonitis, asymptomatic. You look at the CT scan. Okay, that looks like ground glass interstitial thickening. Okay, we need to start thinking about our patients here. They're on oxygen. Okay, then we need to kind of stop. 
or coughing or shortness of breath, which is kind of grade two. So even though the headlines may say that this is very concerned for pneumonitis, we're physicians at the end of the day, and we keep a close eye on our patients. And, you know, many of us look at the CT scan ourselves to look for that interstitial wall thickening. So I think it just requires us to be extra thorough. And I feel like that pneumonitis isn't a, as big a piece in the real life practice. Any guidance on that pneumonitis? So first, uh, increase patient awareness because they have to recognize the early symptom and they should contact medical doctors. Second, screen. Perform a CT scan. According to indication, you should perform it every six to nine weeks because it's really essential to detect an ILD-1. Uh, you can intervene then with steroids, with an appropriate dose of steroids in order to reduce the capability of evolution to a fatal event. In the Destiny 6 incidence, overall incidence of ILD was 11%. Unfortunately, three patients died in the Destiny 6. So it's really essential to screen, to detect, and to treat with steroids. Following this, if you have a grade one, you can rechallenge again with trastuzumab, the Ruxtecan is a lower dose, but it's really essential surveillance. Absolutely. And, and you know, I know there's the two different dosings for you. I know the gastric colleagues, they have like a 6.1, but the pan tumor is like 5.4. And then some of the things that we look at is also you know, is this person in front of us at a higher risk? I mean, do they have a 40 pack, 50 pack year smoking history, right? Do they have underlying yes. COPD? So these are the things that we really have to do a good job. And I think most of us do in terms of screening. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. Surveillance, screening, and treatment with steroids, the three S rule. Yeah. <laughs> and so you kind of touched upon the Destiny Breast 06, and we want to kind of talk about that a little bit. What are your thoughts about that? On the Destiny Breast 06? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, in my opinion, what? it's a practice changing trial, and we should incorporate, of course, in clinical practice guidelines, mm -hmm. moving TDX in the first line setting after endocrine therapy. You know, the discussion was very well balanced. I believe Dr. Ian Krop did an excellent discussion because he highlighted that maybe some patients, let's say bone only disease with an indolent disease, they can move also to a third line endocrine therapy or eventually to a first line capcitabine in order to guarantee a better quality of life. But don't forget that in the Destiny of Six, only 3% of the patients were bone only disease. Almost 90% of them had visceral disease, including 70% liver meds.